On the morning of April 23, 1897, the mill workers at the Williamston Stave Company arrived at work and started their day just like any other. Little did they know that an absolute nightmare would be unfolding inside the creepy house next door. The small village of Williamston, Michigan was a tight-knit community where everyone knew everyone, but it seems that no one truly knew the turmoil and rage brewing inside the house next to the mill. And on that fateful spring morning, a combination of undiagnosed mental illness and pure unadulterated hatred would come to a head, and one of the most disturbing murders Michigan has ever seen would be committed as a result. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Summer Sanchez, and on this channel we talk about crime, cults, and heinous history. So if that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you never miss an upload. Today we are talking about Martha Haney and the gruesome, extremely disturbing 1897 murder of her mother-in-law, Mariah Haney. Before we get started, I'd like to talk to you all about today's sponsor, Aura. I would say on an average day, I receive at least a few phone calls from unknown numbers. You know that potential spam warning that you get when like a telemarketer is calling? I flat out refuse to answer the phone if I don't recognize the number. So my voice mailbox gets filled with these automated telemarketing calls. Just look at all of these blocked numbers. Data brokers will collect your information and this can be public information. This could also be private information and they sell that data to third parties and they end up making tons of money off of selling your information to robocallers and spammers. Now, these data brokers are required by law to remove your information from their system if you ask them to. But the problem is this can be a very frustrating process, but that's where Aura comes in. Aura will identify which data brokers have your information and then they'll send them all opt-out requests on your behalf. So they do all of the tedious work for you. The amount of telemarketing calls that I usually get has been drastically reduced. There's definitely been a noticeable difference. Aura also offers lots of other features that help to protect you online like VPN services, password management services, parental controls, antivirus, and identity theft protection. Aura offers so many features to help keep you safe online and using the Aura app makes things super convenient because all of these features are bundled neatly in one place. So don't let data brokers continue to exploit and profit off of your private information. Go to aura.com forward slash Summer Sanchez to start your two week free trial and it's totally risk free. You can also find that link in the description box. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this video and now let's jump into the case. In the 1890s, Williamston was just a small village located in Ingham County, Michigan. And just like every other area of the United States at that time, it was hit hard by the Panic of 1893. The Panic of 1893 was an economic depression and people all over America were struggling to make ends meet, to keep their families fed, to keep a roof over their heads. By 1897, many of the residents of Williamston had managed to mostly bounce back from the depression. They were starting to get back on their feet. You know, they were starting to find steady work and they were starting to feel some sort of normalcy again. People were still struggling, but things were starting to look up after four very bleak years. But a 37 year old resident of Williamston, Alfred Haney, who everyone called Alfie, and his 29-year-old wife, Martha, were still in a pretty grim financial state. Alfie actually hadn't had steady work in years. Even before the Panic of 1893, he didn't work that often. He would find odd jobs here and there, but never anything permanent and never anything that earned a significant wage. The Haney's were described as being paupers. They were essentially living in poverty. And the winter of 1896 had been especially difficult for their family. The Haney's were relying mostly on donations made by other people people in the village just to survive and they were just barely surviving. But by the spring of 1897, Alfie started hitting the streets again looking for work and he would just go into the center of town and offer up his services. He would do like handyman jobs. He would do little jobs here and there around the town. Pretty much anything anyone needed, Alfie was willing to do. And for the very first time since Alfie and Martha got married three years earlier in 1894, Alfie actually had some steady work. He was suddenly being hired out most days of the week. They still had very little money, but at least they had some form of income coming in. Now, at some point after Alfie and Martha got married, Alfie's mother, Mariah, moved in with them. Mariah and her husband, John, had been among the very first settlers to the area in a place called Locke Township. John had fought in the Civil War and when the war was over, he made his way back home and he and Mariah purchased a farm and 
that's what they did for a living. They were farmers. They ended up having a few kids, one of which was Alfie. He was born on Christmas Day, 1860. Then in 1872, John Haney died, and this left Mariah to take care of the kids and the farm all by herself. In the beginning, it wasn't that tough because she did still have the help of her children, but as the years went by, you know, they started growing up, moving out, having families of their own, and so a lot of the farm work fell solely on Mariah's shoulders. Alfie would go and help his mom out when he could. He would help her with the animals and the chores and stuff, but Mariah didn't have that constant help that she desperately needed and she couldn't afford to hire anyone. So she did pretty much everything on her own. And by the 1890s, Mariah was approaching her 80s and it was just getting to be too much. She just couldn't do it anymore. The farm work was just way too physically exhausting. And I will say that it sounds like Mariah was in pretty good shape for her age. She was in her 80s and she was still pretty much running a farm on her own. She was still very mentally sharp. She could still get around really well. She was still doing chores around the house and everything. So overall, especially for the times, Mariah had aged really well. I looked it up and the average life expectancy in the US during this time was less than 50 years old. And when this case takes place, Mariah is 85 years old. That would have been such a rarity at the time, which just makes this case even more tragic. Mariah was described as a very small woman. So was Martha. Martha was also very small framed, very thin, but Mariah was said to be even smaller than Martha. So Alfie was just living with these two tiny women. So like I said, Mariah could not keep up the farm work anymore. So sometime after 1894, Alfie, Martha, and Mariah all packed up and they moved to the village of Williamston so that Alfie could look for work. He knew he needed to find a job to support his elderly mother and his new wife. So he figured it would be smart for he and his family to move to a more populated area because it would give him more job opportunities. Williamston wasn't very populated at all. It was a small village, but it was definitely more booming than the area where Mariah's farm was. And so the Haney's packed up, they moved to Williamston and they started their new life. When they arrived in Williamston, the only house that they could find that they could actually afford was this tiny little two bedroom house next to the railroad tracks and the Williamston stave mill. The stave mill produced staves, like the wooden slats that barrels are made of. They're used to build other things as well, but this particular stave mill, that was kind of like their specialty. They made barrels. They also just sold like crates of these wooden staves. And this house that the Haney's move into has been described as essentially being a shack, but they had like a little kitchen. They had a really small living room and then they had two Two bedrooms. The house was described as being pretty dirty. The officers who worked the case said the Haney's had been living in squalor. So it doesn't sound like it was a very nice place to live. But this was all that the Haney's could afford at the time. So they were just trying to make the best of it. The workers at the Williamson Stave Mill would see the Haney's going to and from their house. They would see them out in their yard doing their daily chores and stuff. They didn't really speak to them. Like they didn't have a close relationship with the Haney's. But when they would see them outside, they would wave. And the people at the mill soon became accustomed to overhearing very loud arguments between Mariah and her daughter-in-law, Martha. Martha and Mariah did not get along at all. Mariah pretty much knew from day one that there was something really off about Martha. And this is something that other people in the village would say as well. They recognized that there was something wrong with Martha. She was suffering from some sort of undiagnosed mental illness. So Martha Haney was born Martha Pierce, and I think she was born in 1868. She was one of seven children. She had two sisters named Esther and Florence and four brothers who were Richard, William, George, and Odie. And Odie was the youngest of the boys and he actually died at the age of only 13. And Martha's family were farmers, just like most of the people in the area at that time. And in 1884, when Martha was only 16 years old, she married a man named John Woodard. And John was 21 years old when they got married. They went on to have three kids together and we don't know exactly why, but John eventually just ran off and he abandoned Martha. He left her alone to take care of all three of the kids by herself. It is thought that John Woodard left Martha when she started exhibiting some concerning behaviors, which we will talk about more in a minute. Now, when Alfie met Martha, those three kids were nowhere to be found. Martha was upfront with Alfie when they met. She had told him that she had been married before. She had three children, but she never really gave any specifics about where her kids were. In fact, after this case broke, the police questioned Alfie and they were asking him all sorts of questions about Martha, you know, who she was as a person, what was her life like before the two of them got together. And Alfie didn't really have any answers. He didn't really know anything. 
talking about Martha's past. And when she told him that she had been married before and that she had three kids, he had just assumed that her kids were in the father's custody, but they weren't. So where were the kids? This question of the whereabouts of the children sent the media into a frenzy after this case broke. Considering what Martha goes on to do, people thought that there was a chance that maybe she had murdered her three kids. It was discovered though that two of the kids, Ernest and Emily, had been given up for adoption and Ernest ended up with a family in Ohio and Emily ended up with a family in Pennsylvania. But it was the youngest child, George, that was the biggest mystery. He was not given up for adoption at the same time as the older two. And the story started circulating that Martha and baby George had disappeared for several days back in 1891 when George was only about 10 months old. And when Martha finally turned back up, George wasn't with her. So as you can imagine, this story completely blew up. The media was having a field day with the theory that Martha had taken her baby off somewhere, killed him, disposed of him, and then turned back up at home like nothing had ever happened. But the true story of what happened happened to baby George was revealed about a month after Martha's arrest. Martha had not killed George. She and her sister Florence had traveled to the Rocky Beach Benevolent Association in Lansing, Michigan, and they put George up for adoption. A man named Reverend Winfield Sly ran the Rocky Beach Benevolent Association, and he would take in hundreds and hundreds of children, and his goal was to get them adopted out to good families. And people started doing their own research. They started doing their own digging, and they did confirm that this story was true. George George had been adopted out through Rocky Beach Benevolent Association. So the story checks out, Martha did not kill her children. Martha had most likely just been really vague when she told Alfie about her kids and about her husband, because she probably didn't want him to know the real reason why she no longer had her children, why she decided to give them up for adoption. According to Martha's sister Florence, Martha's mental health was already declining rapidly by the time that George was put up for adoption in 1891. Her family knew that there was just no way that she could take care of three kids on her own in her current mental state. And that is the reason why she had given them up. But she had let Alfie believe that her ex-husband had the kids. It is thought that her ex-husband ran out on her because of her bizarre behavior, her undiagnosed mental illness. And with the general lack of knowledge and true understanding of mental illness back then, John likely just took the easy way out and he walked away from his family because he didn't want to deal with Martha's problems. So Martha was likely afraid that if Alfie knew how sick she was, he wouldn't marry her and he would leave her just like John had. But even though Martha was exhibiting some signs of serious mental illness, signs that Alfie had picked up on when they first met, he didn't care. He was totally falling for Martha. But when Alfie introduced Martha to his mother, Mariah, she pretty much instantly had a bad feeling about Martha. She knew that Martha was mentally unwell and she really thought that her son was getting himself into something that he couldn't handle. Mariah had caught Martha speaking to no one on several occasions. She would be having full on conversations with someone that wasn't there. Martha would also randomly break into religious songs at really inappropriate times. Like everyone would just be sitting there chatting and suddenly Martha would just break into song. She also just looked blank behind the eyes and Mariah seemed creeped out by her to be honest. And she desperately tried to talk her son out of marrying Martha. She was like, I am telling you that this is not a good idea. I have a really bad feeling about this relationship. But he was pretty much in denial about how bad the situation really was. Alfie's way of thinking was that Martha wasn't doing anything that serious. She wasn't hurting anyone, so it wasn't really a big deal. She would most likely just get better eventually, but that's not what happened. So despite his mother's warnings, Alfie and Martha got married. And by 1897, Alfie, Mariah, and Martha are all living together in the tiny house next to the mill. By the time the family had moved to Williamston, Martha's condition had gotten noticeably worse. The villagers would later say that they regularly saw Martha walking through the village, talking to someone someone who wasn't there. She would be having full-blown conversations with her dead mother. Most of the time, that's who she said she was speaking to. She said that she was speaking to her dead mother. The villagers also reported seeing her laughing and singing loudly to herself. And the villagers are just becoming more and more concerned as the days go by. The workers at the mill would report seeing Martha out in her yard acting really bizarrely. She would be swinging like large soup ladles around her head and singing really loud to herself, talking to herself, laughing to herself. They also reported seeing 
seeing Martha out in the yard, just staring blankly into space. Now, Martha did have a history of epilepsy. Alfie said that he never saw Martha have a seizure, but we now know that some seizures can cause you to look zoned out. Some people will just go quiet and stare into space. And I know this firsthand because when I was a kid, I had a seizure disorder and I would do this sometimes. These seizures are called absence seizures and it causes a person to just look zoned out for a few seconds and then you just kind of snap out of it. So there is a chance that in Martha's case, these were seizures possibly, but it is more likely that Martha was actually catatonic during these episodes. Absent seizures typically don't last very long. It was reported that Martha would stare and not speak for really long stretches of time. Alfie said that there were days that he would come home from work and he'd find Martha sitting alone. She would acknowledge him and she would just stare right through him. He would ask her a question, no response. She just stared straight ahead and eventually Alfie would give up and he'd just walk away. And in addition to all of this, Martha also had a very explosive temper. She would fly into an absolute rage if something set her off. And the person who was often on the receiving end of Martha's rage was her mother-in-law, Mariah. Martha and Mariah would fight constantly, and these would be full-on screaming matches. We don't know for sure why Martha hated Mariah so much, but it is thought that she knew Mariah tried to talk Alfie out of marrying her. She knew that Mariah didn't trust her and that Mariah was always keeping a close eye on her. And eventually, this animosity led Mariah and Martha to just flat out hate each other. And just keep in mind that these two women are cooped up in this teeny tiny house together all day long. And now that Alfie is finally getting some steady work, he's no longer in the house during the day. They no longer have Alfie there to be the voice of reason to make sure that things don't escalate. So things were starting to get really wild in the Haney house. These fights were getting worse and worse. They were getting louder and louder. And occasionally they actually got physical. Now, Alfie said that he never saw Martha and Mariah just like outright hit hit each other, like punch each other, but they would shove each other every now and then. But that was it, according to Alfie. That's all he ever saw. Most of the time, they just had these really intense, loud screaming matches. The workers next door at the mill, they got so used to hearing screams coming from the Haney house that they honestly just stopped paying attention to it. It was pretty much an everyday occurrence. But then one day, everything went completely off the rails. So on April 22nd, 1897, the day before the murder, Alfie was doing his usual walk through the busiest part of the village. He was looking for work and he spots Dr. Frank Shumway. Dr. Shumway was not only the village doctor, but he was also the village health officer and he was a very highly regarded person in the community. And when Alfie sees Dr. Shumway, he suddenly has a thought. It's become painfully obvious to Alfie that his wife isn't going to miraculously get better. Her mental state has only gotten worse and worse over the three years that they've been married. His wife and his mother are constantly fighting and he just doesn't know what to do. And recently he's actually started to worry about leaving his 85 year old mother at home alone with his wife. He's realizing that he is sort of afraid of Martha. He's afraid of what she might do to his mother. So he spots Dr. Shumway walking through the village and he decides, you know what? Today is the day that I'm going to take action. I'm going to go talk to the doctor and I'm going to get some advice on how to help my wife with whatever this thing is that's causing this rapid decline of her mental state. So he approaches Dr. Shumway and he gives him a quick rundown of what's been going on at home. And Dr. Shumway, he knew that Martha needed help. Like I said, the villagers were all very aware of Martha's declining mental health at this point. So Dr. Shumway tells Alfie, you know, don't worry, just bring Martha into my office tomorrow morning for an appointment and I will see what I can do. So Alfie thanks the doctor, he says goodbye, and he walks away hopeful that he's just taken a step in the right direction, but Martha would never make that appointment because this would be her breaking point. That evening when Alfie arrived home from work, his mother Mariah was in the kitchen making a pot of cabbage for dinner and Martha was in the backyard. Typically he would have went straight outside and let her know that he was home and try to get her to come back in. But before he goes outside to get Martha, Alfie took this opportunity to let his mom know that he had made Martha an appointment with Dr. Shumway. And Mariah, she was really happy to hear this because she did want Martha to get some help. You know, things had gotten so bad in the house, but she was also really afraid of how Martha was going to react to this. The smallest thing would send Martha into a rage. And so Mariah and Alfie, 
week, they were basically terrified to tell Martha that she would be going to see the doctor the next morning. But Alfie tells his mom, you know, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to tell her about it tonight at dinner and it's going to be just fine. So Alfie goes outside, he gets Martha and the three of them sit down at the table to eat dinner. And they're all just sitting there eating their cabbage. Martha wasn't really eating. She was just staring at her plate. And Alfie says in this really casual, nonchalant way, oh, I forgot to mention, Martha, you have an appointment with Dr. Shumway in the morning. Martha looks up from her plate and she says, there is nothing wrong with me. And Alfie calmly says, well, you know what? We're going to let Dr. Shumway decide if there's anything wrong. Things started to get pretty uncomfortable at the table. So Mariah sort of sneaks off to her room. She does not want to be any part of what's about to go down. Martha finally breaks and she starts yelling at Alfie that there's nothing wrong with her. She says that it's all the old woman's fault. The old woman, of course, being his mother. And she's yelling that she wants Mariah out of the house. Eventually it clicks for Alfie that Martha thinks that his mother had been behind the Dr. Shumway appointment. Martha thought that Mariah had been the one in Alfie's ear telling him, you know, that she's crazy and she needs help. So once Alfie realizes that Martha is blaming his mother for the doctor's appointment, he tells her, look, my mom had nothing to do with this. She didn't even know I was going to talk to the doctor. This is not on her. This was all my idea. Alfie then just gets up. He goes into his and Martha's bedroom. He lays down, covers himself up and closes his eyes in an attempt to fall asleep for the night. I think he thought that if he just went to sleep, Martha would just give up and go to bed. They wouldn't really have time to argue about the appointment. You know, if he went to sleep, that would just be discussion over she's going. Martha followed Alfie into the bedroom. She stood next to the bed and she just stared at him for what seemed like forever to Alfie. She didn't say anything. She just stared at him as he was attempting to fall asleep. And after several very awkward, unnerving minutes, Martha finally turns around and she leaves the room and she goes into the living room and she lays down on the hard wooden floor. She knew that she had to somehow convince Alfie that she did not need to see the doctor. She needed to convince him that things weren't as bad as they actually were. And at the very least, she needed to delay this doctor's appointment somehow. Martha likely knew that if she went to the doctor, he was going to evaluate her and she would be sent to a psychiatric hospital. And she was probably pretty scared. So the next morning, Alfie woke up at about 6.30 and Martha wasn't in the bed with him, but this wasn't really uncommon. She would sleep out in the living room most nights. And so he wasn't surprised when he didn't see her. He quickly gets dressed for the day and then he walks out into the main part of the house and he's actually surprised that Martha's already up and she's, you know, messing around in the kitchen. Alfie walks over to Martha and she has her back to him and he says, hey, don't forget, we are going to the doctor this morning. You need to go ahead and get yourself ready. Martha turns around and she looks at Alfie Alfie and she has a smile on her face. It's more of a grin. It wasn't like a huge smile, but Alfie hadn't seen Martha smile in so long. He actually later described their house as being cheerless, which is just so sad. So he was shocked to see Martha in a good mood for a change. And he was even more shocked when she told him in a very lucid manner that she actually felt so much better that morning. She hadn't felt that great in months. And she told Alfie, you know, I really think that you shouldn't miss a day of pay. You know, we really really do need the money. Why don't you go ahead and go to work today and we can go to the doctor tomorrow? So this was on a Friday and Dr. Shumway did see patients on the weekend. So Alfie knew that he could easily just move the appointment to the next day to Saturday morning. Alfie had been totally willing to miss a day of pay to take his wife to the appointment, but she did have a point. They really did need the money. And he had already been worried about finding a way to even pay the doctor for the appointment. So working one more day would allow him to more easily do that. So Alfie is thinking and processing, you know, what Martha's saying. And the entire time Martha is looking at him with this smile on her face. And eventually he just says, okay, you know, you're right. What's one more day? He says, I will see Dr. Shumway in the village today. Like I always do. I'll let him know that we're going to reschedule for tomorrow and it'll be fine. So as Alfie is getting ready to leave and head to work, his mother comes out of her bedroom and he tells her the new game plan. The appointment is still on, but it's going to be tomorrow instead of today. And Mariah, seemed a little uneasy about this news, but she just says, okay. Alfie says goodbye to his wife and his mother, and he heads out towards the village center. After Alfie left, Mariah went back into her bedroom. She got dressed for the day, and then she came out and she told Martha that she was going to start cleaning up around the house. Now, the workers at the mill would later say that not long after they saw Alfie leave for work, they saw Martha walk into the yard between the mill and the house, and she started swinging a large wooden ladle over her head and singing a 
religious song. At some point, Martha went back inside and she started helping out around the house. According to the mill workers, Alfie's mother was going in and out of the house all morning. She was putting laundry on the clothesline. She was also like beating rugs and stuff. And while Mariah was outside cleaning the rugs, she heard banging noises coming from inside of the house. And when she goes inside, she finds Martha standing in front of the living room wall and she's just very intently staring at something. And as Mariah is getting closer and closer to the wall, she can see that the thing that Martha is staring at is a photo of three young children inside of a picture frame. Mariah had never met Martha's kids, but she did know that she had three kids from her previous marriage and she knew that these had to be Martha's children. But there was one issue. The frame that the photo was in actually belonged to Mariah. Just that morning, that frame had held a photo of Mariah's dead husband, John. Martha had taken the photo of John out of the frame and put in a photo of her three children. And the banging sounds were from Martha hanging that frame on the wall. That frame hadn't been there before. And this absolutely enraged Mariah. She was probably feeling very disrespected by Martha. And I am assuming that this frame with John's photo was probably one of Mariah's only valuable possessions. This was probably one of the only mementos that she had of her dead husband. Mariah got really angry and she actually took a swing at Martha and she ended up hitting her on her back. Now keep in mind that Mariah is a bite-sized 85 year old woman but it did piss Martha off enough that she shoved Mariah so hard that she stumbled backwards and she almost fell to the ground. And after this, just a full-blown screaming match ensued. The mill workers said that they could hear arguing that started getting louder and louder over a pretty short period of time. They also reported seeing Martha Haney storm out of the house and she paced around the yard for a few minutes and then she went to walk back inside the house. But when she tried to go back in, Mariah had locked her out. Mariah was probably fearing for her life at that point and so when Martha walked out of the house, Mariah locked the door behind her. And oh my God, did this send Martha into a rage. She's screaming at Mariah to open the door and let her in. She's pounding on the door over and over again, but Mariah wasn't about to let her back in. The workers watched as Martha went around the house and started searching for something. They didn't know what she was searching for, but she was obviously frantically looking for something. Meanwhile, in the house, Mariah has taken the frame off the wall. She removed the photo of the three kids, tossed it on the ground, and then she walked into her bedroom to put the frame up and away from Martha. But as she is doing this, Martha started hacking away at the front door with an ax. That was the thing that Martha had been frantically searching for. It was an ax. Mariah went towards the front of the house to see what was going on and she looked out the window and she could see that Martha now has an ax. She knew that Martha was coming for her. Martha managed to hack away at the door enough to knock it halfway off the hinges. She walked inside, still holding the ax, and she finds her mother in law cowering in a corner near the door. Mariah did try to scream for help, but by this point, the mill workers had kind of went about their day. They weren't really paying any attention to the house. Some of them later said that they kind of lost interest in the fight when they saw Martha searching for something in the yard. They just kind of stopped paying attention. So like I said, Martha is now in the house with the ax and Mariah is on the ground, sort of balled up, trying to protect herself with her arms. Martha swings the ax and she catches Mariah with the blunt end right across the face. And immediately there is blood everywhere. It's flowing all down on one side of Mariah's face. Mariah had fallen backwards on the floor and she was trying her best to sort of wriggle away, but she was already losing consciousness. Martha again hits her with the blunt side of the ax across the cheek and this time Mariah completely lost consciousness, but she still wasn't dead. Mariah had blacked out, but Martha could see that she was still breathing. So Martha takes a different tactic. She drops the ax and then she starts stomping up and down on Mariah's body as hard as she can over and over. And she broke so many of Mariah's Mariah's bones in the process. Her ribs were breaking during this whole thing, but Martha just continued to stomp Mariah's body into a bloody mess. And even after all of this, Mariah is still not dead. She's still holding on. So again, she picks up the ax, she swings, and she ends up taking off a chunk of Mariah's scalp. She swings again and she cuts right through Mariah's throat and then one last swing completely decapitated her. But Martha wasn't done. She had a plan to get Alfie back for taking his mother's side and trying to force her to go to the doctor. So she picks up Mariah's severed head and places it on a dinner plate right in the center of the kitchen table. She then adds a knife and fork to either side of Mariah's head. And then just to be sure that Alfie will see his dead mother's face, she rotates the plate so that Mariah's head is facing Alfie's usual place 
place at the dinner table. And then she starts trying to figure out how to get rid of the rest of the body. And she decides that burning it would be the best option. But she knows that she can't take the body outside to burn it because the workers at the mill would see her. So she decides to just set Mariah's body on fire right there in the kitchen. She grabs a kerosene lamp from the living room and she douses Mariah's body with kerosene. Then she grabs a hot metal pan from the kitchen that has some like old burnt potatoes in it. She dumps out the potatoes and then she adds some hot coals from the stove and she puts the pan between Mariah's legs and the body slowly started to smolder. Then she looked down and she realizes that she is absolutely soaked in blood. So she takes off her dress and she tosses that on top of Mariah's body. She then goes outside and hides the ax under some stairs in the back of the house. And then she goes back inside and she's realizing that the house is starting to fill with smoke. It wasn't unbearable just yet, but it was starting to get pretty thick. Martha slips out the back door into the backyard in order to escape the smoke. But who does she see making his way up the street? Alfie. It was now around noon and Alfie was home for his lunch break. And not only did he not notice Martha standing outside in the yard dressed only in her princess union suit, but he also didn't notice the smoke starting to seep out of the cracks of the house. Alfie had a very distinctive walk. He always walked with his hands behind his back and he always looked down while he was walking. So he wasn't paying any attention. He wasn't even looking up. He was probably just thinking that he was gonna come home and have this nice little break with his wife and his mother. And remember when he left for work that that morning, Martha was all smiles and she was actually in a good mood for once. So he had absolutely no idea that he was about to walk into this horror scene. So Martha sees Alfie walking up the street and she starts to panic. She doesn't know what to do. So she walks back into the house and she hides in Mariah's bedroom. Alfie finally reaches his house and as soon as he does, he's hit with the most horrendous smell. It's a smell that he had never experienced before. It's just absolutely atrocious. And not only that, but now he's noticing that there's smoke seeping out of the cracks of the front windows. And when he gets closer to the front door, he can see that it's been pretty much obliterated by something. He doesn't know what the hell is going on, but he knows that he needs to make sure that his family's okay. And so he cautiously peeks his head inside of the house and he's squinting, you know, to see through all the smoke and he's, you know, scanning the room, trying to see any sign of anyone. And that's when he spots it, his mother's severed head sitting on a dinner plate at the kitchen table. And Alfie let out the most blood curdling scream. The workers at the mill, all of the nearby neighbors, everyone even remotely close to the Haney house heard this absolutely horrific scream and they all turn their attention to the house and they see Alfie running for dear life down the street back the way he had come towards town. He was running to go find an officer. He knew he needed to find help, but the neighbors and the people at the mill, they didn't know what was going on inside the house. They just saw smoke and they assumed that the house was probably on fire and that Alfie was running to go get help. So a few of the locals jump into action. They run towards the house with buckets. They go to the back of the house and they start like frantically pumping water from the water pump to fill their buckets. And one by one, they start throwing buckets full of water into the house through the window. A man named John Robinson eventually joins in and he's trying to help them, but he can see that the others aren't getting anywhere. Someone really needs to go into the house to identify the source of the smoke. So he walks into the house and he pretty much immediately spots this mangled heap of something lying on the floor. And he can tell that this is where the smoke is coming from. So he dumps his bucket of water onto this pile of something. He runs back outside, refills his bucket, pours more water on the pile. He repeated this a few more times until he was confident that he had put it out. And now he's trying to figure out what the hell he's looking at. So he starts sort of glancing around the house and that's when he spots Mariah's severed head on a bloody plate in the middle of the kitchen table. Then he looks back down to take a closer look at this mass on the ground and he can see human hands. Someone had obviously been brutally murdered in this house and he just wanted to get out as fast as he could. But just as he was going to leave, a bedroom door suddenly opened and Martha Haney comes walking out and the two of them kind of startle each other. Then Martha just calmly walks over to the potatoes, you know, the ones that had been in that pan. She just starts shifting them around, repositioning them. Then she walks back into the bedroom. She throws on a dress. Then she walks back out and she sits on the couch for a minute. Then she suddenly sits up and she starts peeling the wallpaper off of the walls. John Robinson is just standing there. I'm assuming mouth agape in total shock and disbelief. So while Martha was busy peeling the paper off of the walls, John Robinson slowly just backed out of the house to go call for help. Then Martha calmly walks out the back door and she started digging a hole 
hole in the yard with her bare hands. Now, by this point, several people had gathered in front of the house. You know, all the smoke had alerted a lot of the people in the village. Alfie had managed to quickly track down a local deputy when he ran into town. The deputy's name was J.W. LaRanger, and he told them what he had seen back at the house. So he and Deputy LaRanger had hopped into a carriage and they made their way to the Haney house. And they were coming down Elevator Street, the street where the house was located, just as John Robinson was running out for help. Robinson spots Deputy LaRanger's carriage and he starts like motioning him to come look in the backyard. Go look at what's going on in the backyard. So LaRanger jumps out of the carriage and he runs into the backyard and there he finds Martha Haney frantically digging a hole with her bare hands. Deputy LaRanger approaches Martha and he says, what happened? And she very calmly said, I killed my mother-in-law. She's inside the house. Martha was taken into custody while they tried to figure out exactly what happened. The Ingham County Sheriff was called in to help with the investigation. His name was J.J. Raley. A coroner's inquest was conducted. A coroner's inquest back then involved rounding up six local good and lawful men. And these men would have to go into the Haney's house, literally visit the crime scene as is, body on the ground, head on the platter. And they were to determine if a murder had actually been committed. And if so, was it likely that Martha Martha Haney was the murderer. And in this case, because this was such a gruesome crime scene that no one had ever experienced before, and because of the horrendous smell, the sheriff had to make sure that whoever they chose to be a part of the inquest had a strong stomach. Of course, they declared that this was a homicide and that Martha Haney was the one responsible. And so Martha was formally arrested. She had to be given morphine on several occasions during her time in the county jail just to calm her down. She would sometimes try to harm herself. On one occasion, she started bashing her head into the side of the prison wall. Martha's brother Richard lived in a totally different area of Michigan, but news had traveled. And when he heard everything, he went to go visit her in prison, but she didn't even recognize him. She had no clue who he was. While Richard was visiting Martha, she started singing a song to herself that she had made up. The lyrics to the song were, oh, I can't go to heaven, to hell I must go. Murderers don't go to heaven, and that is where I'm bound to go. During my research, I read a book about this case, and it was actually written by Sheriff J.J. Rayleigh's great-great-grandson, and the book is titled, To Hell I Must Go, and he got that title from Martha's song. It was obvious that Martha was very mentally ill, so she was evaluated by a few doctors, one of which was Dr. Shumway, the same doctor that she was supposed to go see the morning of the murder, and when they questioned Martha about the murder, they asked her, you know, did you kill Mariah with an ax? Because I think at this point they didn't know for sure they hadn't found the weapon yet, but they did assume just based on her injuries that it was an ax. And Martha's response was, I don't know, I might. I killed her anyway. And then I got on her with my feet and I jumped on her as hard as I could. Yes, I did. My mother told me to kill her. Martha told the doctors on several occasions that it was her dead mother that had been speaking to her on the day of the murder. And her mother had been the one to tell her to kill Mariah. She said that when Mariah slapped her over the picture frame, her mother told her that Martha needed to kill her before Mariah killed Martha. She said, I turned her over and I killed her and she did not kill me. In the end, Martha was found to be insane at the time of the murder. We don't know what Martha's official diagnosis would have been back then, but it is believed that if this case happened today, Martha would have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Martha was sent to the Michigan Asylum for the Dangerous and Criminally Insane in Ionia. And pretty much as soon as Martha arrived at the hospital, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis. She had had a cough throughout her stay in prison and all throughout the trial, but everyone thought that it was from smoke inhalation, from, you know, all the smoke that she inhaled on the day of the murder. But Alfie later told police that Martha had had that cough. And who knows, maybe the tuberculosis exacerbated her mental illness. Martha Haney ended up dying from tuberculosis just 17 months after the murder. She spent her final days in the Michigan Asylum for the Dangerous and Criminally Insane. And it's thought that Martha's mother, Susan Pierce, may have died in the same hospital. Susan's death record shows that she died in Ionia, which is where the hospital is located. Ionia isn't anywhere near where Martha's family lived. And there's nothing else really in Ionia at the time. It was really just this hospital. So it is believed that Martha's mother may have been committed to the same institution for an unknown mental illness. Alfie managed to get his life back on track, and three years after the murder, he met a woman named Alice Cornell. The two of them started dating, and Alfie ended up secretly moving in with Alice, and this would have been really scandalous back then, and apparently it was also illegal since the two of them weren't married. Some of the neighbors figured out that Alfie was living with Alice, and they weren't married, and they reported them to the police, and the two of them were actually arrested and prosecuted for lewd and lascivious cohabitation. 
they were given actual jail time for living together out of wedlock. Alfie pled guilty and he served 10 months in prison and Alice also pled guilty and served eight months in prison. After they both served their prison sentences, they actually did end up getting married and they lived happily together until Alice died in 1910. And sadly, Alfie spent the rest of his life alone and living in the streets. He died of a stroke at the age of 76. And that was the case of Martha Haney. Please let me know what you guys think about this one down in the comments. If you like this content, please consider subscribing and also liking this video and giving me a comment. That is the best and easiest way for you guys to support me and my channel. Don't forget you can go to aura.com forward slash Summer Sanchez or check the description box for the link to start your 14 day free trial with Aura. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching and I will see you next time.